Hi, Sasha. Hi, Stella. How are you? I'm very well. I think this forthcoming episode with Alex Capo is 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 really important. I know he's he's been working with with myself and with Genspect to kind of look for a new approach for schools, and it's been extraordinary the the individualized approach of one school director can yeah. open up all sorts of options for schools everywhere if you listen to because this is a man who really cares for his, his school community yeah so we'll we'll talk a little bit about the school in a moment but you know alex is the director of this school that's very small there's only 41 students and they brought really pride themselves on using this individualistic approach very family oriented and um very concerned about like supporting the mental health of students and he describes that around between 2016 and 2020, it's an all-girls school, and they started to see girls coming in with questions around their gender identity. And like many other school directors, you know, Alex just deferred to the experts, you know, and yeah. implemented an affirmation policy. And the, the way he describes it is that a lot of these kids were discovering their quote unquote gender identity in the context of like a psych hospital, a behavioral health hospital, no history of gender dysphoria and having really complicated mental health problems. Many of them were admitted to psychiatric hospitals and in those programs were questioning their gender. And then after being discharged and coming to their school, kind of starting off with a trans identity. And he started to realize that this was not working well. The parents felt pressured. The social contagion, as he says, was spreading like wildfire. Mm. And he started to see that these were not uh, students who were actually benefiting from this. He said, you know, we were talking and spending so much of our energy on pronouns. Meanwhile, the root issues that these kids were dealing with were going unaddressed because all yeah. of our focus was on gender. And so we, we loved this conversation with Alex and we want to touch on something important because how small the school is, he had to be very cautious not to give too many anecdotal stories. They really value the privacy of their students. So Alex is talking in generalities, but you're really seeing what I think is like a little microcosm of what's yeah. happening on a grander scale, yeah. which is gender is the distraction and the school is getting wrapped up in the distraction and all the real problems are getting missed. Yeah, exactly. I, I really think more than anything, Alex has kind of offered schools an alternative approach to gender by being brave enough to, to, to kind of care enough for his, mm -hmm. his, his students to see if he can do, do a, a new alternative way. I remember when he first wrote to me, I remember he said, and I remember the phrasing, there's two phrases that stuck in my mind about Alex. First of all, he wrote and he said, we've got into a bit of a mess about gender. Mm. And I, th I remember thinking, wow, there's a very brave, honest person yeah. who's, who's, yeah. who's calling it. And then I remember, and it was some time later, we did, you know, quite a lot of training and thought and thinking about it and approaches. Then he said, it's changed. We've operated, we've implemented changes. We've taken a new approach. And now, Stella, there's a culture of desistance in the school. And I was like, and the phrase, a culture of desistance in the school, that just like there was a social contagion of ROGD, of, of gender distressed teenagers, he noticed when he implemented changes, there was a social contagion of desistance swept yeah. through this school. And it was just such an exciting concept for me because it was like, well, that will really help people out. You can, yeah. you can have a, you know, you can have a social contagion of health as well as the mm -hmm. social contagion of, 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 of unhealth. So, yeah, yeah, I'll never forget reading and think a culture of desistance. Isn't this, That's doesn't huge. this just open up a vista? It, like it opens up a whole horizon of there's other ways. It doesn't have to be dysfunctional. Yeah. And when he was describing some of these examples, like vaguely, what you could see is the kids were holding gender with a lighter touch. They were just, yeah. it was more flexible. It was more like, yeah, you know, in, in certain contexts, I go by this name, but here at the school, you can call me so-and-so. Like there was just a more flexible approach. And I think that's always a sign of health to have a more flexible sense of, of 
like less rigidity around like yeah. I can't be happy unless you do A, B, and C. Like that's not good. And 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 we talked about you know not putting that kind of burden on the young person anyway because they're already struggling and school is hard enough and like going to a new uh. school is scary enough. So it was it was amazing. And yeah. um, before I read um, Alex's bio, is there anything else you want listeners to know about this episode? I remember Alex mentioning, you know, that he had lost, you know, friends and that the other schools around him, even though he's evidently very, very eminent and he, mm-hmm. he he's an experienced and skilled clinician, mm-hmm. he had lost friends and the colleagues around him weren't supporting him. And it, it's it's a kind of reflection of, of this world that the, the braver ones who are stepping forward aren't getting supported by people who know that they're good at their job. Anybody listening yeah. to Alex knows that he's yeah. good at his job. Yeah, it, it, this world, you can lose friends and then make new ones. So we hope that Alex will feel solidarity amongst other clinicians like us. Yeah. Um, let me read a little bit about his bio. Alex Capo, LMHC, is the executive director of the Charlton School in Burnt Hills, New York. Alex has over 25 years clinical experience working with children, adolescents, and families in various clinical and therapeutic settings, as well as schools. He's facilitated trainings for administrators, mental health professionals, teachers, and students for over 10 years, and he's been with the Charlton School in various clinical and administrative capacities for the past 20 years. So we're very excited to present our conversation with Alex Capo. Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, we probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture. And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Hi, Stella and Alex. Hi, Hi, Sasha. Hi, Stella. Um, I think this is going to be a really valuable episode. I'm I'm really excited about it. I think, uh, Alex, you've got a a really brilliant psychological take on how to run. Uh, a therapeutic boarding school is that the right phrase and i'm is that right we we refer to ourselves as a uh, therapeutic learning community so kind of somewhere between a boarding school and a uh, and a residential treatment uh, center yeah and i know you enough to know that your 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 community has really gone through kind of quite a a, a very very interesting arc around oh gender and and mental health issues so i'm i'm really excited to hear everything you've got to say today great i'm excited to be here (laughs) so where do we start i mean maybe you can tell us a little bit about your school maybe right before gender came into the picture and then how did it show up in your students and in the in in your school community sure so, yeah, so the, the school itself is, um, we're small, you know, by comparison. So we're 41 students uh, at capacity. We have about 28 residential students, students who live here, go to school here, um, you know, jobs in the community, you know, home visits, that type of thing. And then we have around uh, 12 to 14 students who are coming from local school districts um, just for the day program. So. And, you know, kind of the, the depth of services clinically to the program includes art therapy and equine therapy um, and, of course, individual family um, and group. So the majority of the young women that come to our program uh, come to us voluntarily. Um, we really look at admission for uh, parents as partners in treatment. Um, that's important, again, because family therapy is such a big part of what we do. Uh, and the young women who come to us, you know, not to, you know, put them in too um, specific of a category, but they come with a host of mental health, you know, diagnoses and, um, and emotional struggles, anxiety, depression, um, you know, some personality disorders, uh, gender, and they are coming to us after multiple failed interventions. Uh, A lot of hospitalizations, a lot of therapeutic 
uh, schools, you know, uh, out west. So it's not uncommon that by the time, you know, students and families reach us, there have been 10 to 15 psychiatric hospitalizations and other failed placements, wow. mostly for self-injurious uh, behaviors or suicidal um, ideation. Mm. Okay, so then they're, they're coming in with some complicated backstories. And at what, around what time did you start to notice these young women also presenting with concerns around gender in addition to these other things? Yeah, we, we kind of, um, you know, 2016 was the first time we had a student um, who started presenting with, you know, some gender questioning um, and was really uh, heavily focused on not only social transition, but, but medical transition. Um, things, though, didn't, and, and most of that, you know, in looking back, kind of happened as that student was transitioning out. Um, and, and, you know, we have still been uh, in touch. Um, and that has, she has kind of, you know, completely medically transitioned. The, the real kind of wave, you know, of the gender uh, questioning students came 2018, 2019, and really strong through 2020. Uh, to mm. current. So that was our, our largest, uh, was about six. And what we saw or what it seemed like was happening was a common theme. We were getting students with no kind of gender questioning, you know, uh, episodes or, or incidents in their developmental history, both early childhood as well as, you know, early adolescence. And then entering either one or multiple psychiatric hospitalizations or programming and then coming out at least from a social transition say i have figured out you know why my life has been so difficult or i have figured out why things have been so hard for me and it's because i'm and then you know the list goes on i was trapped in the wrong body or I feel like i'm um you know this and so at that time again 2019 2020 that seemed to be more and more of the consistent referrals we were getting you know seven eight nine of those students um you know in a in a pretty short period of time and can i ask um how many staff in and around how many staff you know how many students type thing and how much training had you received and what was the general response when really a, a, a high number for, for, for a small school mm -hmm. suddenly presented yeah. with what was presumably perceived as a new issue? Yeah, so, so all of the um, young women that come to us are between the ages of 12 and 18 uh, years old. We can work with students through their 21st birthday, but it's not typical. Um, we have a high staff to student ratio. So our classroom size is six students, one teacher, one support staff. But for 41 students, because we are 24 seven, you know, 360 degree of care, we have just under 100 staff members to support those 41 students. Wow. OK. And had they received tra training or what did they think of gender or where, where was the general yeah. vibe? Yeah, you know, not Stella. And, and I really, what is so um, interesting in looking back is, you know, in that period of time, um, and, and I was at the, the, the charge of it, you know, we were so focused on the optics of the program and, and really in some ways just ignorant in our, in our um, admission kind of screening or and on both sides that, you know, we have always existed to really try to fit, you know, the right student and family to the program. Like, who are the students we currently have? And then will this incoming family and student fit? You know, what will that do to the program? So we were still really assessing all of those new student admissions through that lens. And then there was this gender thing. And we were going, OK, yeah, so we'll call, you know, her Chris. Big deal. Let's bring her in and we'll figure it out. It's a great kid. It's a great family. You know, mm -hmm. let's get to work. Mm -hmm. And once we had about six of those students on campus and we were 100 percent affirming 
Uh, we were looking to local colleges. We were looking to what other agencies were doing. All of the New York State, you know, education um, documentation and guidance, you know, was so fear based at that time. And we really went 110 percent, you know, put our pronouns on our email signatures, you know, really, you know, started talking, um, affirming. And looking back, it was we were so focused on, you know, this kind of idea of what are the optics of the Charlton School going to be to the to the larger world. And um, if we're not affirming, then we cannot possibly be a student centered program. And our foundation has been we stay small. We individualize, you know, every student's you know, treatment plan here. We are not a one size fits all model. Um, so which, of course, is incredibly interesting to me today and, and why we've kind of moved away from affirming, right? Because for years we have prided ourselves on saying we're not a one size fits all model. We don't we don't subscribe to mm -hmm. one theory. People come with different things, people. And yet here we were, every single student coming in, putting them in the model. So what happened? You, you were affirming these six students. And what did you notice? Did you see some kind of negative repercussions from that? Did you see a bit of a contagion within the school? Or what happened when you were yeah. using this one size fits all? Yeah, so, so the contagion was wildfire. You know, students who were already here that did not ever talk about gender were now saying, I want, you know, to be referred to as male pronouns, blah, blah, blah staff were really tripping over themselves trying to be accommodating again in, in an attempt to really support you know students we started changing names we started adding quotation marks you know alex quote sally you know and and mm -hmm. literally i'm not exaggerating every week we were changing you know documentation we were changing and and all the while we had this very small yet strong uh, parent group. And I will say it was 100% of the moms that time, students, mothers, who started to take some risks, quite honestly, and share some of their experience, you know, with me. And what we really found in the turning point for me, and I still give our families, you know, the credit for, you know, where we are today as a program, because when we stopped focusing on kind of the optics, and we really started listening to the moms of these young women, we started to realize we were doing some, some damage. Um, and I think as we, you know, myself and the clinical and kind of residential leadership team, as we started really allowing these people to speak, what we found was that the mothers especially were just kind of going along with the script that previous programs have given them, the hospitals have given them, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to get your daughter out of this program, you need to go with this, you know, social transition, because if you don't, the suicidal behavior will increase, the et cetera. And again, then they're coming to us and we're thinking, well, they must want this, you know, this must be good, you know, and, but we never asked the question. You know, we never at admission said to any one of those parents, are you OK with, you know, with this, you know, not directly. You know, it was it was kind of in there, but we never really listened. Um, and it was really when we started listening is when we started questioning the affirming model and really the entire, you know, um, you know, um, diagnosis and, and label in general. And before we go further into that, how did you know it was going wrong? Did you see mental health of, of people disintegrate or was there something that made you think this isn't actually working as I would have thought it would be? Yeah, I think it was the confusion. You know, I think it was the confusion of we were spending, you know, uh, so much time talking about pronouns and gender. And, and we would go yeah. to whatever it would be, a child study team meeting or a clinical team meeting. And we would, you know, it's like, well, what about all this childhood trauma? What about all these family connected 
fitness issues that, you know, we like, mm. we were not getting to the root causes, you know, um, and that really became apparent when this group of, you know, kind of five or six students um, left, you know, graduated the program, either got their high school diploma and, and left, or, you know, were really at the point where family and, and staff felt like, okay, they're ready now to transition back to their, you know, their, their local high school. And out of those five students that left, every single one of them transitioned back socially to, you know, their biological um, sex and, and given birth name. So that was really like, we have to look at this. You know, that's when the whole team said something is happening. And what I am still to this day, you know, what keeps me awake at night is of those five kids, three of them are really struggling still. You know, after all this, you know, two years of clinical intervention, and I really believe they're struggling still because we spent so much time in the in the gender world and we never got to the root causes of what ended up you know, bringing them to the program. Yeah, and I, I'm dying to go back to that. There is such a, it's such a good point you raise about the, the emphasis on names and pronouns. It's an obstacle. It's a, it's a shield for, for depth to occur. It, it stops people from going, getting to know somebody. It's like an invulnerability shield. We'll talk mm-hmm. about names and pronouns, but we won't talk about my hurt place inside. It, exactly. it, it's an obstacle to therapeutic progression. It, it, at least for the students and families who, again, I feel like we're trying it on as a shield. You know, in there, there were two students and, and still are, you know, who I think are genuinely working with us to navigate that, you know. Um, but but yes, for the most, it was exactly what, what you said. And again, quietly behind them, I think the parents were saying, we're wasting time, you know, we are wasting time, you know, and we were saying, well, we're the clinicians, Um, you know, and so again, I think once we started to believe we're wasting time, we remembered we actually are clinicians and we're supposed to be neutral, we're supposed to not, you know, um, take sides and we're not supposed to be so child affirming that we're colluding, right? um, Mm -hmm. One of my favorite episodes of yours, by the way, Mm -hmm. Collusion. Oh, oh, I love yeah. that one. Episode <laughs> seven, I think. That was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so first of all, I mean, I have to say what I'm noticing is that I've been doing this work since 2016 and there's kind of like new waves of people that I'm encountering in my work. And I'm starting to meet people like you, Alex, who earnestly started out trying to use this affirmation model and then through their own experience and, and observing what happens when you do this, having like some doubts about it. And so I think it's really important that we kind of recognize like the type of, I guess, courage it takes to say we as a whole school system might have done something that wasn't in the benefit of these kids and these families. So like, I just want to say that's really amazing. And I I definitely don't think you're the only person in, in education who's probably been thinking about these things. And your story may give other administrators or school heads the opportunity to say, okay, maybe we can rethink this too. So I just want to start by saying that. And I, I'd love to hear like, what was the next bridge? Because obviously you're here to talk about the way you transform the culture at your school to be a little bit more neutral and more therapeutic. So what was the next step? You start to see these things going wrong. You start listening to the moms of these kids who are having doubts. And then what happened? I, I think at some point you contacted us at Wider Lens and, and you connected with Stella, but what was the bridge there? And then what happened when you started to start making changes? Sure. So the, um, the, the bridge was, was again, the, the parents, right? So we really then said, well, let's bring this to parent support group. Let's create a, you know, a smaller group and let's have these conversations. And, and that's what we did. Um, several of them were in um, one of your parent support groups as well. So that then became the bridge to you both and, um, and others. The first move, quite honestly, was I was in a conversation with Deborah So um, hmm. through COVID. Um, and again, I look back on it um, and in such a naive way. Um, Deb's on a video conference with me and, and I'm reading the book and I'm going, this is science. You know, people are arguing 
science. There's something mm -hmm. wrong here. You know, like you can't argue facts and science. And I got on this uh, half hour uh, video call with Deb because I thought I'm going to bring Deb so into onto campus and I'm going to let. And she basically said to me, "You do not want me anywhere near your campus." And I was saying, "What do you mean? This is going to be great." And, then, and she said, "You you trust." Me. You know, you don't want this. You know, you have to think this through. You have to. And, and to this day, I am, you know, I am forever grateful. So I kind of had that in the back of my mind. And, um, and then working alongside these parents really got introduced to Stella. I, yeah, I think I remember if we, I was running parents uh, support groups and they were making noises that, you know, there was, oh, God, there was a direct... I said, Stella, Stella, <laughs> Sasha, Stella. I'm like, okay, I'll call the people. Let's figure it out. Yeah. No, and, and really that, that is how it, how it went. They, they really saw you as, um, you know, kind of the, exactly what you just said to me, Sasha. People who were not afraid to say, hey, I'm not sure where this is all going. But something doesn't feel right. So let's take a look. And I think that that's what they were looking for. So, you know, now I found that we were then trying to create that same space for our families on campus. And when we did, we got the real story. You know, no, we weren't interested in, in this at all. No, we don't think that, you know, this is really um, an issue that, you know, she was ever struggling with. They started sending us pictures. Um, and, and really that that it was so powerful to look at, you know, some of these young women, you know, 12, 13, then from these pictures, you know, that were now in our program comparatively. And and you could almost, you know, and again, I, with my therapist hat on, you were looking through, you know, these pictures and you were just seeing the pain, you know, in, in these current, you, you know, young women. And so that really evolved to we need training we need to really take another you know look at this all the while we were losing a lot of friends you know there were not other you know residential programs that were really willing to take that step there really were not um you know any support from the board of ed or any other you know individuals and i don't even mean it challenging i just mean in reaching out and saying could we look at this 2015 guidance, you know, um, New York State Education Department, and can we can we really take a, a deeper dive because we're we're learning some things, and um, and when we kind of got nowhere with that, that's when we we really went a lot more into uh, conversations with Stella. Uh, once I felt comfortable, you know, in what she was saying. Um, that's really when we decided to, to have the first group um, be introduced to Stella. And that was some of our strongest, you know, as our clinical director, our clinical team at that point in time, our director of residential services. You know, so we started with a, a small group of individuals who had the clinical background and experience and who were also maybe not where I was in thinking we have to do something different. But they were at least open to the idea that maybe there there is another way. Um, mm -hmm. And Stella did her first training, and I think came with all her passion and all her wisdom, and, and you know just put facts and, and emotions and, and memories into into you know the staff, and they were blown away. Um, and really, I would say the majority were saying, "Okay, that was a lot, and I'm not so sure we want to abandon." you know, this entirely, but there's enough there to think about. And then others, I think, were, were more skeptical. But that allowed us to then really think about, okay, what did we like about that first training? What are we just not ready for and we need to take out? What should we focus on and who should the next group be? Um, and our next group were the teachers, the teachers, aides, and, and that staff specifically in the school because there was a lot of doubt there. And at the same time, there was a lot of, okay, Alex, you know, we, we trust you, we think, but if you really want us to, you know, kind of share your vision, you, you got to bring more than this anecdotal, you know, information. And so we had Stella come and do that training with that, that whole school staff. Um, and it was incredibly well received. You know, we had people now questioning and saying, 
this is great because really all they wanted was some language. You know, they needed a script that when a student said to them, why are you not calling me Sally? You know, um, I want to be called and, and they could tell them. Uh, so it wasn't even that they were opposed to, you know, kind of this transition away from affirming. It was more of give us the tools so we know how to do that and still yeah. maintain these relationships with these kids because it is the basis for everything we do here. You know, And I think a key part of this was you managed it. You brought in, from what I can gather, the senior experience, the people, you, like you said, you chose them. And then you waited, as far as I remember, you waited for a little while to kind of almost let that evolve. And then yes. you brought in... You know, so it was not done fast and it wasn't done. Um, it wasn't done in a kind of uh, here. Here's the truth. Go. It wasn't done at all like that. You really managed the situation, which I think is a credit to you and your kind of management mm. skills that you kind of realize this is big. There's a lot of concepts. This is a change of direction. It's like changing a, a, an oil tank. You know what I mean? We have to really yeah. do it quite slowly here. No, and it's it, can you it, talk it a little more changing. about your, your thought? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, can you no, say more was, about your yeah. thought process there? Like, what was the, the the first group that you had Stella do the training for? These were kind of senior level people. And Stella, what did you talk about in that training? Was it more conceptual? I, I From what I can remember, Alex can correct me, but I, I kind of gave <laughs> everything, you know what I mean? I oh. said, well, to begin. <laughs> and I Absolutely. kind of said it all like a... Yeah, because yeah. I'm very, very aware, by the way, that when I get into some of these places, I mightn't get back. And I want to say a lot because I want to say, yeah. oh, well, you might think of suicide. Here's the real facts around suicide. Oh, you might think it's just like being gay. Here's the facts around this. Oh, you mm -hmm, might think the mm -hmm, affirmative mm -hmm. model has an evidence base. So there's so many things that so many myths mm -hmm. and misinformation that I want to correct that I could yeah. be. I could be accused of overdoing it a tiny bit. I, I, no, I'm, la I'm laughing because it's that same passion. And it, and it has hurt me in this transition, right? Because that passion, oftentimes with people who don't have all of the information, is construed as he is just anti-trans. He is just anti all of this. He doesn't, you know, and really, I think, what was so exciting to me about it was the neutrality. You know, it was like, this is what being a clinician is about. You know, it's about getting this student who comes in and says, I'm trapped in the wrong body and you need to refer to me as Peter, even though my, you know, uh, my real name is Sally and being able to say, well, it's great to meet you, Pete, Sally. Um, that sounds like it's incredibly important to you, but really until mm -hmm. we get to know you and you get to know us, we're going to go, you know, so that's what was so exciting. But I, I think the majority of the people in the room, you know, that day, um, were like what you just said, Stella, you know, there was so much passion and so much information that it was almost like we just, we just got hit with a, with a bomb, you know? Um, so how are we going to now take all this? you know, and synthesize. Um, and it was definitely a feeling of like, you know, like, yeah, and who's with me? You know, and it was like, anybody? <laughs> you know, so I think the the excitement for we have to do something with this to, to help these students and families was easily, you know, um, viewed as anti-trans. They don't believe it. Charlton School will never take another student who's gender questioning again. And in fact, it was the complete opposite. You know, it is like we're, we are going to be so much more effective with this large number of students that is coming in looking for help along with their families because we are now, you know, gaining some real knowledge and information. And we're really, as an entire system, starting to put together a much better way of, you know, kind of uh, assessing and then phasing out some of this, you know, some of this work. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for the show. To take an even deeper dive and support the show, join our listener community for access to exclusive content, practical tools and resources supporting gender and identity exploration. 
We're so grateful to our sponsor, Genspect, an international organization which offers an alternative to WPATH, providing a range of education, resources, and supports to anyone impacted by gender distress. Genspect unites many different organizations globally and gives voice to thousands of previously untold stories. For more info, visit genspect.org. And thank you to our sponsor, Rhyme. Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics is a non-profit organization dedicated to improving long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. And now back to the conversation. A, a very interesting thing you once said, um, it was kind of a throwaway remark, but it always stuck in my head. You said something like, you know, we're not talking about gender and we're not getting that much pushback from the student body. Every so often it's like they remember that they have to complain to you, but really, mostly, they're, they're, they're not. It's, that's not actually happening. No, and, and that's, you know, to kind of go back to your question, Sasha, that, that is what happened when we really, you know, had, you know, more training, and, and, and that is ongoing, um, and we really started looking at, well, how would we, you know, put, um, you know, a different plan together, et cetera. The first step that we decided to take was, it's and, and all the evidence was there. Right? It's it, this is going to be much easier for students and families if we address it right at admission. You know, so what we need to do if we're really yeah. making a commitment to these students and families, we cannot let another student come in here um, who doesn't have who hasn't done you know all of that previous work. Right? I mean, it'd be a different story if a kid today came having been in therapy for you know, two years specifically focused on, you know, gender, had explored it. That's not the, the type of student I'm talking mm. about. I'm talking about the norm for us is none of that early childhood, none of that developmental in a hospital, rapid onset, and now they're coming to us, you know, day one admission. Our script was exactly what I said. Well, it's nice to meet you, and that sounds like it's a really important, you know, issue for you. And, and we genuinely believe it is right because they they have locked on to this as nobody understands that if i could just transition out my whole life would change like we genuinely believe how powerful that is but because we're good clinicians and because it really hasn't had enough time and because you're in one of the most crucial developmental stages of your life Mm -hmm. You got to trust us, you know, we're going to take this slow and we're going to mm -hmm. work with you and we're not going to let that drop off as a clinical goal. And when we started doing that, you know, the families were essentially going, thank you, because now we were the quote unquote bad guys, right? They were basically, yeah. we were giving yeah. families permission to say, yes, hey, we love you. And if you really still want us to call you Pete, okay, but. You're going to this new school and they're not going to allow that. So and what we found, you know, in that summer of 2021, I guess, is really where it started. Um, we saw kids coming in really frustrated day one, you know, forget it. This is nonsense. You know, nobody told me this, even though we had. Right. This was all a part of the you know, initial interviews mm. and stuff. But then it dropped off so quickly. You know, it was like two weeks and then we never heard about the other pronouns again. We never heard it because we started to actually get to know this young woman in the context of this new program and, and really started to get into family therapy. Um, yeah, I think this is really key because as you said too earlier, this can be a distraction and it can be a way of deflecting the real work. And like what you're saying, Alex, is so congruent with what I'm often talking with families about is like, let's make it really clear from the beginning where the boundaries are so that we can essentially move on and help you with all the other real stuff that you're dealing with. Now, gender may still be a persistent issue that is kind of a thread in this young person's life. And as an adult, like they may decide to pursue that. But for a lot of these young people, if it's operating as a distraction mechanism, 
it's really a disservice to the young person when all the adults in their life go, oh, yeah, I'm going to be totally distracted by this. And we're going to oh, yeah. do the gender thing 10 hours a day, like talking about pronouns when that's maybe a cover for something else that needs real yeah. attention. So I think yeah. it's so interesting that you guys saw once you stabilize the expectations and focus on the real issues for a lot of young people, this kind of will go away. Definitely. You know, to, and, and again, most of our population being rapid onset. Right, right, right. Yeah. And when did you know that it was kind of going well, that you've kind of, you'd kind of changed tack? And I presume, Alex, you were, you know, very kind of monitoring the situation and thinking, how, how is this going? And did you have many kind of kind of crisis of faith about your new your new way or or was it fairly handy? How, how did it go? Yeah, no, it, it's still, you know, we, we get asked that quite a bit and it's still a little unclear. Like I, I genuinely believe in this transition and, and we're still in it, you know, by the way, um, I, I do think we've lost some staff as a result. You know, I, I do think we had a couple staff members who in, in the over the last three years said, OK, you know, maybe, but not for me, you know. Um, and but from a student standpoint, I mean, how it shows up on campus today, it's more of the, the students will refer to each other as, you know, with different you know pronouns and names sometimes. But it's it doesn't have the power you know, socially yeah. um, and, and certainly at the adult level that it did. So, you know, we can work with that, you know, and again, that to me, that is adolescence, right? I mean, they're trying yeah. different things on. So it is normalized it, you know, in a way by by taking more of a, of a clear stand. And again, I think what it is, is helped um, f family members the most, you know, in the last however many you know, student referrals, I can tell you, we, we have only lost one uh, student referral, you know, as a result of that kind of script, as a result of our clinical director saying, well, just so you know, you know, we're not affirming. And if we were to take, you know, some of those next steps, this is what it would look like. Um, and we had one parent say, not then, sorry, not the right school, which and it probably wasn't, you know, so, but again, I, I, I feel like that is a much better place uh, to be today than kind of where we were just blindly, you know, um, mm. thinking we were doing right. So. so what what are some of the practical ways that you have shifted gears? Because what I hear you saying, I think is really developmentally appropriate, which is within the peer culture, kids can experiment with their identity and call each other different names and kind of play around with these these parts of themselves. But the adults are not going there. So what does that yeah. look like practically? Like when a student comes in in admission, I know you have this conversation. Is that like, hey, we respect everybody is on a process, but we are going to refer to you by whatever name is on your birth certificate? Or like, how do you explain this to students and, and yeah. I just love to hear some of the practical. Yeah, no, exactly. Just, you know, just like that. that oh, you know, yes, you know, we, we understand that this is uh, something you were working on in your last program, or this is something you were working on in the, in the hospital or, or whatever. Um, here, what we've learned through a lot of trial and error is um, we're going to start with your, your given name at birth um, and, and your birth sex, you know, and, and, and not lose that this is a very important issue to you. And we really want to bring your mom and whoever else in, you know, to these conversations. And again, part of it is, you know, it's day one. It's a brand new program. There's mm -hmm. enough anxiety, mm -hmm. you know, kind of yeah. with any new student and family. So they're kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, half listening, half nodding. Um, so I don't think that's the, the powerful intervention as much as, you know, what has happened in the peer culture. And it's funny, even when we take students now, you know, into the community, some of the ones who, you know, um, are more comfortable, you know, with it will say to whoever they're meeting, um, 
oh hey it's it's nice to meet you you know um my my name is is alex but you know you have to call me alex because that's the way the charlton school mm. works with me but i really i really you know if you want to you could call me sally and there's this awkward kind of like mm. uh, okay and, and i go so you know mm. let's go with alex and it just kind of it's okay, you know. It, it, it's okay. It, so it, it, it feels, yeah. Alex. It feels, Alex. Just how it obviously should have been all along. You know what I mean? That like the adults take the adult position and the children play yes. the children. And it's we've been doing yeah. it for decades. Like we know and, how and to I kind think of that's, be like yeah, this. That's a good way to explain it. You know, I wouldn't let a kid, you know, say to any you know gender outside you know call me butch yeah. you know if, it's like no that come on you're at an interview or whatever you know we that would be a correction <laughs> yeah. right it's like socially that's totally. you know we're helping you grow you know we're supposed to be helping you grow it's so, it's a key oh, thing yeah. we've moved from being child-centered to being child-led and mm. when i say we as in society and it, we lost something with that. You know what I mean? Being mm -hmm. child led is putting a burden of responsibility that is that ch children are not able for. While child centered was a lovely idea and we just yeah. pushed it out. It's I've, I've been studying this whole move to being child led and it's it feels pivotal to what this whole thing is. Just listen to the child. The child knows whether the child is five or 15 or really in distress. They know as if they have secret knowledge. And it's yeah. it's so heavy a responsibility as as a kid myself, you know, when I was about 12, I kind of made this decision. I convinced all all the adults around me that I was right. It was a crazy, awful decision that I led yeah. everybody into. And I, I still look back thinking, oh, A, Stella, God, you really lost your way there. And B, isn't it amazing that I pulled all the adults with me? Well, uh, me, me on t uh, in the lead <laughs> and then yeah. trailer behind saying she really seems to think she and it was a terrible terrible decision yeah. it's, it's just it's always rested with me that i i led it even though i was very young but that i think is what i mean it's certainly why i've been a part of this you know school for 20 years in, in different capacities but it that is that you know the adolescent young women that end up here are so smart. They are so passionate. They are so insightful, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think mm -hmm. pick whatever you want, but they are gonna grab on to whatever that belief or that issue is. And and half of the, the young women on this campus are much smarter than me. So I, I would never win any one of those battles, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of how we approach it is like, yeah, you cannot work with adolescents and not embrace that. The now is everything. And tomorrow it's going to be completely different. My whole life feels like it is out of control. Oh, and by the way, in the middle of the most confusing time of my life, I'm four and a half hours away from my family and I'm on a planet, you know, that feels like Mars someday, you know? So I think when you look at that whole picture and you start to, or we start to do this kind of psycho ed therapy, you know, kind of, therapeutic learning community approach that's what we're doing we're basically trying to say let's not make it about one thing let's just talk about all the feelings and about how crazy it is to be in your shoes right now you know it must feel so whatever and again i think that's how clinically and from a milieu we are really trying to approach it so we're trying to like we would anything well let's not talk about you know drugs let's talk about how you got there let's not talk about you know the, the pronouns let me let's talk about what is it about yourself that you don't want blah, blah, blah. and i think staff are really they're really looking for more of those scripts and interventions right so this is where we are today right when that when um uh, joe and lisa and, and you both put that get a guide together that was like a godsend for us you know i mean we like we locked into that thing i shared it you know with everybody because it gives you not only the developmental like here's the questions you know remember as a clinician we were trained to ask and, and this is the things that you know we should be doing in the case study so you know we really are in that stage as an agency you know we're trying to give people all of this information 
mostly on that clinical level. And then what, you know, can we give to our residential counselors and, and, you know, teaching staff who are dealing with kind of the in the moment stuff, you know, that, that comes up. So um, then I was introduced to Chan, who is brilliant, you know, and who is really partnered uh, with us and is helping write, you know, um, our own kind of version of, of the get a guy, you know, so we're and really, I just explain a little bit yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, just yeah sure. A little bit here, yeah. yeah. Chan, Chan is kind of working for Jen we, we we've got some school policies and we put out some kind of extensive school policies. And Alex had the brilliant idea to kind of look at the Get a Clinical Guide, look at the Genspec school policies and Ooh. see what could be done in, in the larger sense. It was su- such, a, such a good idea. So Chan from Genspec is working with you, Alex, to produce something quite unique, but incredibly useful, which Ooh. is a kind of a, a clinical psychological guide for a school. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. It is much yeah. less of a policy. I almost we were talking earlier, like that's almost yeah. too harsh or, or too rigid. You know, it really is becoming yeah. kind of a guide of, you know, for parents, really, and students. You know, here's what you can expect as you enter the Charlton School from a clinical assessment, milieu, you know, and then really giving some, you know, brief but but digestible here's some of the the psychosocial theories or biosocial th- that we're drawing from that support this you know approach in a real evidence-based um, way and so the that is really where we are you know once we get this kind of guide um, to feel like it's really ours it really speaks our language it really you know can be useful then we're going to start small group trainings on the various parts of it, exactly what we did with Stella to the different, you know, parts of the agency. So, you know, as this small community, we can really all be talking the same language and and, and giving the same approach. And can I go back, because I don't want us to miss anything, because I think what you've got to offer is really, Mm. it's kind of dispatches from the ground, like of of running Mm. something and actually enacting it and creating something that I think is really valuable for so many people and families. Am I right in thinking there was I did a third training and who was that to? Was there another break and then a third training with with another group or have I the, am I right? Our residential yeah. our residential counselors. Yeah. So that was actually the second training. Yeah. So the first okay. training clinical staff, the second training Senior was clinicians. our our yeah, our, our residential counselors. Those are the groups of individuals that are I working. Get it in our dorms with students after hours, you know, then it was the teachers. Um, and the teachers was the big one. And that was quite, there was a serious time. I'd imagine, was there a year between the first and the last or maybe even two like, years? Two years. It, it was a, that this was a two rushed. year. Yeah. No, that was a two year. We're in year three right now, you know, um, yeah. with this kind of uh, clinical framework guide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was very well managed by you. I think it was very well thought out, very slowly and kind of gently analysing how to, you know, your your care for your school really comes through. Well, thank you. You know, you're giving me a lot of credit for being careful, but it was fear. You know, I was I was basically <laughs> Sorry, saying, yeah. this is going to be really scary, you know, and I'm losing people. I don't know that, but it feels like I'm losing people. So, again, like any good clinician, you're you're just thinking about that pace. And so I but I don't know, like I wouldn't have changed any of it. I think we needed to like Deb. So with me, you know, I needed to be blown out of the water and brought into this world, you know, and say, you don't know what you're dealing with. You know, this isn't normal clinical work. There's something bigger at play here. And then giving people that, you know, that kind of helped me reset and i think the you know the three series we did with your training stella and ours was exactly the same we learned a lot in the first one we pulled the groups together what did we like what did we not like what worked what didn't let's run the second what did we like what would we take out and by the time we got to that teacher group um again that was by far the most well-received you know um, training at all 
and really helped us make that next shift to the new approach at admission with students. Uh, that's huge. Um, I wanted to touch on something like, can, can you share? Because one of the things that we talk about a lot on this show and that we think about a lot is the way that some institutions, whether it be school system, medical institutions, are undermining the concerns of the parents. Like you touched earlier on like listening to these mothers who had concerns and feeling like they were just following the script that was given to them by the psych hospital or by the behavioral health center or whatever. Can you talk about within the Charlton School what is the philosophy that underpins the involvement of family? Because you said family therapy is so important. Like the parents are so important. Why? Maybe it's like a back to basics, but why does that matter when a lot of schools seem to operate on this idea that like, actually, we know best, the parents could actually damage their children by not following our instructions or psych hospitals very much undermining the role of the family. So why do you guys have this family centered approach in general? Yeah, no, that's um, it's a that, it's a great question. So forever, you know, we have taken this for right or for wrong approach that families, mostly the moms, know this student better than we could ever possibly hope to know. Residential treatment at least in New York State, has a very bad reputation. You know, it, it's their institutions, it's places where, you know, really um, rough kids go, kids get, you know, abused there, parents who have to put their kids there, you know, have failed. And we have been on a mission for 20 plus years to really redefine that and say, these are not bad kids. These are not bad parents. In fact, they're the most courageous parents on the planet because as a parent, I could never imagine saying to my child, I don't know how to help you. you know, I mean, we are biologically and genetically hardwired to be that person from birth and to, as a parent, have to face that and then have the courage to say, I don't know how to help them anymore. So I'm going to put them in the care of a bunch of total strangers, you know, and some maniac who doesn't even affirm <laughs> you know, young women is such a powerful, yeah. you know, move that it, 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 be, it has definitely become the foundation. So, you know, one of our the first things you learn about us is we partners with we partner with families in treatment. Period. They're the first partner we have. They know more than anybody. And because, again, at least in New York State, the way you get into a program like ours is you have to fail up the ladder of interventions. Even though 50 percent of the people in this, you know, in, in, at least in the young women that come to us lives know, well, this intervention isn't going to really work. But we have to try it if we want to get to the next level of care. Mm. We're pretty sure this isn't going to work, but oh. we have to try. So. You know, by the time we get these families, they don't trust therapists, nor should they. They don't believe that this is going to be, you know, the last, you know, stop for, for their kid. They have put all their faith in treatment professionals and have been trying to, you know, be the good parent by listening to the professionals. And I think our move is to say, we don't think we're the professionals anymore. We think you know your kid better than we do. And so we really want to take our time in understanding who they are from your perspective. And then we're going to do our professional stuff and we're going to try to help paint the picture. But, you know, we got step one, we have to put this developmental, psychological, psychosocial history together because it's so fragmented. You know, mm -hmm. hospital mm -hmm. one has diagnosis ABC, hospital mm -hmm. two gives you a different diagnosis. You know, so mm -hmm. our job, as I see it, is to really slow down and basically bring the parents in and say, let's get it right. You know, before mm -hmm. we put any new label or before we take any real direction, let's make sure we have all the, all the pieces. And I really think that must be refreshing 
you know, to families, or at least that's the feedback yeah. that we get is, yeah. um, this is what was different. You know, oh. I didn't feel like I was crazy. They genuinely felt like they wanted to know what I had to say. They actually liked my daughter, you know, like, mm, um, yeah. So, and I don't let people forget that. I mean, I, I make staff sick with that. If I've said it once, I've said it 300 times, like we have people's children in our care. Mm. And the day we forget that, we might as well shut down because we've lost, you know, our mission. So. Yeah, that's really, that's really powerful. And it's so true as you say it, but I think so many school systems have kind of veered quite far away from that, that awareness. And, it's really nice to and hear I, you say that. I, and I really do think at least the school leaders that I talk to, they, they, that is not the intention. You know, I think they genuinely mm -hmm. believe like we do, mm -hmm. you know, at one, mm -hmm. that we were really doing right, that there is something that bad that's going to happen. And I, I think where, you know, we've had the most success is to start with the transparency. You, again, forget the gender, but can we just be, transparent you know if we if we make no other move as a school district or as an institution or a tree can we just include them in what's happening you know so and so came to school today and they asked to be called whatever we wanted to bounce that off you know i just think taking that step would take triangulation out and would increase you know relationship and transparency but it, it does feel like it's a it's a monumental step. Again, we have the luxury of being a private 41, you know, student school with some really engaged families. So I, I don't understand their struggles. But um, but these are the things that have helped us along the way. C could I ask one question, which is slightly off the point, but it, it's kind of on my mind. Um, you've mentioned quite a few times and I've certainly noticed and I know you have, Sasha, how often it's mothers um, who are very involved with this. And uh, it's it's really extraordinary with my parent groups, mothers, 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 the odd father, mothers, mothers, mothers. And um, I just, it occurred to me that, will you, Alex, have more of a, well, you've been running this community for a long time. How long have you been running it? And is it only specifically mothers for gender or is that just in general? This Like we're talking 95% presence, a massive presence of mothers over yeah. fathers. And, and that's why I said I'm going to, you know, get myself in trouble because it's not I, that's the truth. Right. But it's not. We have a lot of involved fathers on campus. The experience that we have seen is they're they're on board. You know, they don't think any of this makes sense, you know, or they're going down. the, But they're just kind of following along, I think, in, in at least the families that we've worked with, the person who's taking that first courageous, courageous step, mm. nine times out of 10 is, is the mother mm -hmm. you know, it's amazing. who always is to blame for all of this. Right. Yeah. And when we say that all the time, you know, it turns out it's not your fault, you know? Mm. Um, so, so it, but it, it is. And then I think as a dad myself, I, I think that is a, you know, we kind of just tend to take a backseat. Like, yeah, mother really does know, best and we're not going to muddy you know the water we certainly don't want to make it worse we certainly don't want to especially in dealing with you know young women um mm. so yeah we have a lot of incredibly devoted and involved dads but from a who kind of gets this out there mothers it's amazing really no yeah yeah hmm. it is interesting yeah <sighs> So we're coming Are to you going to open up yeah. a huge number of schools all around the country? Yeah, yeah. That is my Watch next out. question, because I am sure there will be a lot of interested families. Yeah, no, I mean, I really I'm not. I, I and I tell people all the time, I, I love my job. I am uh, one of the few executive directors in a, in a community like this that knows every single student on campus. I know every family member. I know exactly. every staff. And the day we go beyond, you know, 40 something kids. I'm probably not the right guy, you know, for, mm. for the job. You're um, so right. So, you're... you know, my, my hope is to, mm. can we get, you know, the, the message out there uh, that this yeah. is possible, yeah. you know, it's yeah. possible, you know, and we need more help. I have no yeah. friends left. 
Oh, you, you have, have us. You have two friends now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd love to be your friend, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think that's such a crucial point because when you look at, we, we interviewed Hannah Barnes talking about JIDS and we interviewed people in, in different clinics, Jamie Reed talking about what happened to her. The numbers broke the system and the numbers turned it into a factory. And you mm. insist on the individual approach and you realize yeah. you were doing one size fits all, which is not the chartered approach. We go for individual, small and getting to know. And it feels yeah. key and crucial yeah. to going forward that you, you can't do big numbers when you're dealing with serious distress. No, no, it doesn't work. And, and believe me, we've tried, you know, we have tried and we have tried all different types of parameters at admission. Well, maybe, yeah, we know this student's shown some aggression. Yeah, we know she's probably a little more drug involved, than, but let's try it. It, it, it always hurts the larger community. You know, so um, wow. yeah, I wish we could help more families. I, I, I really do. At the same time, I think we are trying to get really um, focused on outcomes. You know, we have a very hard time on the other side kind of fundraising for some of these programs because we're so small. And most mm -hmm. people who give money are looking at numbers. And, you know, and we're trying to say, yeah, but look at the impact, you know, 100 percent of our students who are eligible for graduation are graduating. You know, we are getting them mm -hmm. to graduation. You know, we are getting at root causes. You know, listen to our parents who say she was in this hospital in this, you know, really expensive, you know, out of state placement and did it. But until she got here, you know, we didn't really get our daughter back, you know, and so I think that's part of this problem right this whole mental health crisis is we're not getting to root causes we're not slowing yeah. things down bringing families in doing really good assessment and solving problems we're just moving them through wow. putting labels mm -hmm. mm -hmm. band-aids and, and it's it's creating more of a crisis wow it's yeah fine. Well, we'll definitely include information about your school for all of the listeners who, who want to learn more about Charlton School. And um, it's been so exciting to hear about the way you're collaborating with Geta on creating this kind of school guidance philosophy. And I think if you can kind of put that out into the world and show other school administrators and leaders of schools that this is possible. I think that will be really huge. So we're really excited about that. And I'm so glad that you and Stella connected and crossed paths and helped you kind of develop some kind of individualized policies. Like that's so crucial. I, I honestly, I owe every bit of success that that we have had on this journey um you know to stella but to you both really i cannot tell you uh the number of times in my routine as my daughter is in dance i'm listening to gender wide oh, lens yeah. and she comes out with, and goes oh god you know <laughs> but quiet, quiet, quiet. <laughs> that's a good point it is my routine yeah, it is my oh, routine that's so, so thank you yeah thank you yeah well, th thanks, Alex. And I think that it's so lovely and really beautiful and generous of you to realise we did something brave in the Charlton and we're going to be a little bit braver s still. We're going mm. to bring it out and say, you know, there are other ways to look at this and one size doesn't fit all. And let's go back to the basics of psychology and training and seeing the individual for themselves. I'm, I'm delighted that you've come on. I really am. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And really, it has been uh, an absolute privilege. So thanks again for uh, well, giving me the time. Thanks. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.